According to FBI statistics, only 51% of homicides are solved. And that means that nearly half of the homicides taking place in the United States are left unsolved, leaving the affected families with no closure and no answers. In Massachusetts alone, out of a staggering 10,000 homicide cases, 4,000 remain unsolved to this day. Another case that also comes from Massachusetts is one of 16-year-old Molly Bish. Molly was a lifeguard at Commons Pond, and she was spending her summer monitoring kids during their swimming lessons. But on June 27, 2000, just after a week into her dream job, she vanished without a trace. Molly's disappearance shook the close community of Warren, Massachusetts and everyone was left in fear, disbelief, and terror. The case of Molly Bish is disheartening and tragic beyond measure, and even 24 years after her disappearance, some questions still remain unanswered. Welcome to True Crime Stories. If you're new here, I post new true crime cases every single week. So if you want to see some good old fashioned true crime documentaries narrated by yours truly, hit that subscribe button. It's totally free and it'll keep you up to date with all of my future videos. But Molly Ann Bish was born on August 2nd, 1983 to parents Maggie and John Bish. Molly was the youngest of three children and the family of five lived in Detroit, Michigan. But something very frightening happened that caused the Bish family to relocate. See, in the Bish's old neighborhood, a woman had been abducted while coming home from work, and later, her lifeless body was found. This incident prompted the Bish family to make the move from Michigan to Warren, Massachusetts. Warren is a small and quiet town with a population of just under 5,000 people. The neighborhoods in Warren are safe, and in a small town like this, the community was tight-knit and almost everyone knew everyone. This, according to the Bish family, was the perfect environment for raising their kids, John Jr., Heather, and Molly. Even as a child, Molly had a personality that made her extremely lovable. She was outgoing, kind, and had a quirky sense of humor that added more layers to her fun and endearing personality. Being the youngest, everyone, including her siblings, loved her. Molly's parents and siblings were very protective of her, and they adored her to pieces. Molly, at the time of the events, was also in a relationship with her high school classmate, Steve Lucas. Even though Molly was the apple of everyone's eye, she was extremely smart. She excelled in school and was a model student. She was passionate about one more thing though, and that was sports. She was an outdoorsy girl who loved to play different sports, and she even played soccer and basketball in high school. She loved nature and was extremely athletic. Her athletic nature led her to follow in her brother, John Jr.'s footsteps, and she trained to become a lifeguard. John had been a lifeguard for almost three years at Commons Pond and had a lot of experience. This was perfect because Molly had the best teacher and he walked her through the training. Being a lifeguard was the perfect job for Molly. It combined two things that she loved most, being outdoors in nature and children. Molly, aside from being athletic and sociable, also loved children. In fact, Molly had dreams of working with and for children, and she wanted to pursue a degree of education in college after she graduated from high school. But becoming a lifeguard wasn't going to be a cakewalk. She had to work hard to earn her certification, but luckily she had her brother by her side, and after putting endless determination and efforts towards her goal, Molly finally got what she wanted. Molly got a job as a lifeguard on June 19th of 2000, where she would supervise children in swimming and other activities during the summer at Commons Pond. Commons Pond is a large pond, and it's essentially a recreational area in the residential and kind of central part of Warren. The pond is also surrounded by a man-made beach, which is the perfect place for Warren residents and their families to enjoy a hot summer's day. In the summer, Commons Pond was a hot spot for numerous water-related activities for children, even swimming, and Molly was elated to finally start her new job. Molly's mother, Maggie, would drop her daughter off every single day just before 10 a.m and saw Molly joyfully running to the pond to get started on her lifeguard duties. But eight days into her job that Molly loved and enjoyed every moment of, Commons Pond would be known for something very horrific and tragic. And sadly, Molly would also become a part of this tragedy. The lively and carefree residents of Warren, Massachusetts were now plagued by fear and grief when something terrible happened on June 27th of 2000.
June 27th of 2000 was not a happy day for Molly. She woke up at 9 a.m. to the news of her soccer teammate getting injured after she was hit by a car while riding her bike to work. Molly was overcome with sadness, and it was safe to say that her morning was not off to a great start. She was also running late for her lifeguard shift at Commons Pond, where swimming lessons were due to begin at around 10 a.m. Molly donned a blue swimsuit underneath her clothes, and Maggie drove her to work. On the way to the pond, Molly made a stop at a local convenience store to buy a bottle of water at 9.50, and CCTV footage actually caught Molly at the cash register. But no one could have anticipated that this would be the last sighting of Molly. Afterwards, Maggie and Molly drove to the police station to pick up a two-way radio, as Molly's job required her to reach out to emergency services or the detectives if an unfortunate swimming accident or situation ever took place. Also, the two-way radio was the only means of communication for Molly as telephone service wasn't available at the Commons Pond. Finally, at around 10 a.m., Molly and Maggie reached the pond, and the mother and daughter said goodbye to each other. There was no one at the pond at that time aside from Molly, Maggie, their car, and a sand dumping truck near the beach. Maggie was relieved that she could leave Molly at the pond safely and drove back home. Maggie remembered Molly making a beeline for the beach to set her things up. In 10 minutes after Maggie left Molly, parents started to arrive with their children for the swimming lessons but there was no lifeguard. Molly was nowhere to be seen. When a mother of one of the children made her way to the lifeguard station, she saw that a first aid kit was open. Molly's bag was on a bench. Her towel was spread over a chair with a pair of sandals neatly placed in the sand by the chair, along with an untouched water bottle. The mother assumed that Molly had skipped work and went out with friends. So she rummaged through Molly's bag to retrieve a whistle and kept an eye on the kids who were swimming. But at around 11.44 a.m., when Molly was still missing, the Commons Park Commissioner, Ed Fett, called investigators to let them know of Molly's disappearance. But the Warren Police Department weren't too worried at that time. They thought that Molly had run away or skipped a shift in rebellion to hang out with friends. As 1 p.m. rolled around, and there was still no sign of Molly, though, the police notified Molly's mom, Maggie, and her sister, Heather, of Molly's disappearance. Maggie and Heather were shocked, and they had a very bad gut feeling that something was wrong. They went to the police station, understandably frantic, and the investigators tried to calm them down, but they were still sticking to their runaway theory, claiming Molly would most likely be home very soon. But this is true crime stories, and we all know this is not what happened. Maggie and Heather were completely unconvinced, and they stressed that Molly would never do such a thing. Molly was a responsible young girl, and she would never skip a shift on a whim. Also, Molly's shoes, a pair of flip-flops, and her bag were left at the pond. So it was very unlikely that she would have run away barefoot and without any of her belongings. Molly's fears were solidifying, and the family started to search on their own, asking Molly's friends, teammates, and even her boyfriend Steve if she had visited them. But no one had seen or heard from Molly. 16-year-old Molly Bish had disappeared, leaving behind all of her belongings and a lot of confusion for her family and friends. After much persuasion from the Bish family that Molly hadn't run away, the Warren Police Department started to take Molly's disappearance a little more seriously, although they made another terrible mistake. See, the police didn't tape off the area where Molly went missing. Commons Pond was still open to the public after Molly's disappearance, and the flock of people around the potential crime scene tampered with any evidence that might have been left behind. Worse yet, Warren is a small community, and the detectives had little experience in missing person cases. So the Warren investigators collaborated with the Massachusetts State Detectives in their search for Molly. Initially, the Massachusetts State Police suggested that Molly might have tragically drowned in the pond, which her family refuted at the time, as Molly was an excellent swimmer. Also, if she lost her life in the pond, wouldn't you assume she'd been found pretty soon afterward? I mean, these kids were showing up to swim within minutes of Molly's disappearance. So this theory didn't even make any sense. Still, dive teams as well as volunteer groups on boats were sent to search the pond for Molly, but nothing came up. After hours of searching, the surrounding woods were also searched, but there was no sign of Molly or any clue that could lead anywhere. Detectives called off the search until the next morning, as it was getting dark, and on June 28th at 6 a.m., an even larger search mission was conducted. The search for Molly was the biggest and most expensive missing person search in all of the history of Massachusetts at this time. But even though everyone was looking everywhere for Molly, the results were unfruitful. 
The investigators did suspect Molly's boss and her boyfriend at one point, but they were soon ruled out as potential suspects, as they had airtight alibis, and from the looks of it, they were deeply concerned for Molly. The detectives also searched the path leading to a nearby cemetery, which was a secluded area surrounding the pond. Police thought that Molly's abductor had lured her under the pretense of being injured, since Molly's first aid kit was opened at the pond, and Molly may have then been tragically snatched. This was never proven, but this is a very likely theory. But there was one more thing that was brought to the police's attention, and that was a bizarre and chilling incident that took place a day before Molly went missing. What was even more insane about this incident was that Molly's mom, Maggie, witnessed it, and her statement would lead to one of the only tangible clues in this case. On June 26th, Maggie dropped off Molly at Commons Pond as normal. But as soon as she pulled up in the parking lot near the pond, Maggie saw a man. He had a mustache and was sitting in his white car, smoking a cigarette. He was parked pretty close to where Molly's lifeguard station was set up, but what made Maggie's skin crawl was how he was staring at Molly. Maggie defined this unknown man's intense gaze as terrifying. He was staring at Molly the entire time. This frightened Maggie, and she proceeded to accompany Molly all the way down to her lifeguard post and even helped her set up her station. Maggie thought that the weird man would go away by the time she reached the parking lot, but when Maggie approached the car, he was still there. Maggie was extremely disturbed by this man's presence, and she met his unnerving stare. To Maggie's shock and horror, the man locked eyes with her and kept staring at her, occasionally squinting his eyes and casually taking a pull from his cigarette. His face was stoic, devoid of any expression, and this left Maggie feeling scared and extremely uncomfortable. Maggie stated that she stuck around in the parking lot as she was terrified of this man and what he may do to her daughter, as he was lingering just a few feet away. This strange encounter took place the day before Maggie's disappearance. The police, who were left alarmed by this revelation, asked Maggie if she saw this man on June 27th, to which she answered in the negative. Maggie only saw a couple local businessmen dumping sand from a truck for the beach. This was why she felt that she could leave Molly on her own at the pond, as there was nothing suspicious about the two sand workers whatsoever. The businessman, as well as the sand truck driver, were also ruled out as suspects by the police and they immediately focused their investigation on the strange but unknown man with a white car. They also asked people around the area, including the sand truck driver, and he said that he saw that same white car in the pond's parking lot, just minutes before Molly arrived for her lifeguard duty on June 27th. A worker at the cemetery also noticed a white car on the morning of June 27th. Shockingly, the path to the cemetery was very close to the swimming hole, and everyone suspected that this was the place where Molly was unfortunately abducted. There was another problem, though. The detectives didn't know what the strange man looked like, so they asked Maggie to define the man. And according to Maggie, he was an old man, maybe in his 50s, with salt and pepper hair. His eyes were dark, and he had a mustache. Soon after, a composite sketch of the man was made, and it was made public to help catch the apparent abductor. But this single clue led to no solid leads. The Bish family didn't stop trying, though. They wanted to spread the word on Molly's disappearance, and they even made a website and an email chain system to reach out to thousands of people about any information on Molly. In an effort to refine the sketch of the man, Maggie contacted Jean Boylan, a famous sketch artist who may have helped get multiple high-profile cases solved. They met at a local bed and breakfast, and after nine hours, Jean presented the final sketch, which she later tweaked by adding a cigarette on Maggie's request. Maggie thought that the sketch was identical to the man that she saw on June 26th. But even with this sketch, not a single one of the thousand tips received led to any breakthrough. Sadly, Maggie's case was hitting a brick wall over and over. But three years after the disappearance and abduction of Molly, something did surface but it shattered the Bish family's hopes of finding their daughter alive. In the fall of 2002, a hunter was roaming through Whiskey Hill in Palmer, where he spotted a scrap of cloth. He didn't think much of it, and shockingly, a year passed before he told his friend, Tim, about his discovery. Tim immediately notified the investigators, and during an extensive search in the heavily wooded area, the piece of cloth was finally discovered. When detectives showed the cloth to the Bish family, Maggie immediately recognized it as Molly's blue bathing suit, the same one she was wearing on the day that she disappeared. 
The bathing suit was sent for DNA testing, while the 500 acres of wooded land was combed for more clues. Mind you, this was about two years after Molly had vanished. Six days later, the DNA results came back and confirmed that the bathing suit did indeed belong to Molly. While a massive search of the area on Whiskey Hill was carried out on June 3rd, another human bone was found, belonging to someone between the ages of 14 and 20. And after testing it for DNA, it was unfortunately confirmed to have belonged to Molly. Six days later, on June 9th, a total of 26 human bones were found from Whiskey Hill, which was five miles from Molly's house. All of the bones belonged to Molly, and it was concluded that Molly had lost her life. The police believed that the perpetrator had dug a shallow grave and buried Molly, and then her remains were dug up and scattered by animals in the woods. Due to the extensive degree of decomposition on Molly's remains, investigators were unable to determine the cause of her passing. All of these discoveries crushed Molly's family. Tragically though, the discovery of Molly's body didn't lead investigators to the criminal either. Molly's abrupt abduction and inexplicable demise struck everyone in the quaint community of Warren. People were crestfallen about the young 16-year-old girl's passing, but their sadness was soon clouded by fear and horror because whoever snuffed the life out of Molly was still out there and no one knew who this person was. The Bish family laid Molly to rest on August 2nd, 2003, which would have been Molly's 20th birthday. Molly's family was devastated and they bid farewell to a bright and cheerful girl with heavy hearts and tears in their eyes. Molly's birthday, and it's supposed to be joyful, had turned into a day of grief for her family forever. But while Molly's case had gotten nowhere in the years following her disappearance and funeral, the Massachusetts detectives didn't back down. They wanted to find whoever targeted Molly on that fateful day of June 27th. Molly's case was highly publicized, featuring on 48 Hours, America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries, and Disappeared. The police also questioned a lot of people about Molly's disappearance and subsequent passing, as it was a full-fledged homicide investigation at that point. Violent predators, convicted assaulters, and criminals with disturbing rap sheets were questioned about Molly's disappearance. And after Molly's tragic passing was confirmed, detectives also came up with a criminal profile. They believed that Molly's murderer was a white male between the ages of 18 and 50 who had a violent criminal history smoked cigarettes, and was familiar with the area where the crime took place. But the thing is, this could describe nearly 50% of the U.S. population at the time of the crime. While this description was certainly a start, it was really nothing more than a shot in the dark. A number of suspects caught the police's attention. In 2005, a Connecticut man who was charged with attempted kidnapping in New York was under investigation in Molly's case, but there was no evidence to support that he was involved. Later in 2009, another suspect stood out to police. He was Rodney Stranger, and he had a grave criminal history. Rodney, a resident of Florida, was convicted of taking the life of his girlfriend who lived in Southbridge, Massachusetts, a few miles away from Warren, where Molly lived. Shockingly, Rodney matched the composite sketch of the strange man that Maggie saw. If that wasn't alarming enough, Rodney was actually living in Warren, Massachusetts at the time of Molly's disappearance, and even was fishing in Commons Pond quite often. He also went hunting in Whiskey Hill, where Molly's remains were later discovered. And to add to the oddness, Rodney had moved from Massachusetts to Florida a year after Molly's disappearance. Rodney's brother also owned a white Chrysler, which Rodney also drove occasionally. And when he was questioned, Rodney denied having any involvement in either of the young girl's disappearances, although he pleaded guilty to taking the life of his girlfriend. Rodney was sentenced to 25 years in prison for his girlfriend's murder but he was not charged for Molly's case, as there just wasn't enough evidence for the court to convict him. And just like that, more years passed by with no breakthroughs in Molly's case. That was until November of 2011, when Detective Dan Malley named Gerald Battistoni, AKA Confidential Informant Number 62 for the Eastern Hampton County Narcotic Task Force as a possible suspect for Molly's abduction and demise. Gerald was also a very violent man who was arrested and was serving a sentence for continuously taking advantage of a young teenage girl in the 1990s. He had a lengthy criminal past dating back to the 1980s, and he also had frequented Whiskey Hill where Molly's body was eventually found. Gerald also matched the composite sketch and he was a person of interest in Molly's disappearance. He even tried to end his life in prison after he was connected to Molly's case, which is highly suspicious. 
Molly's family asked for DNA testing, and Gerald's DNA was obtained by the Massachusetts State Police. But this lead also led to a dead end as Gerald passed away in November of 2014. There was never any other mention of the DNA they collected from him, so I think it's safe to assume it probably wasn't a match. On June 3rd of 2021, though, a new person of interest was brought forward to the district attorney, and it was Francis P. Sumner Sr., a registered offender. His criminal record was more than 20 pages long. He was arrested for aggravated assault and kidnapping, and was given concurrent sentences of 15 to 18 years for the assault and 9 to 10 years for the kidnapping on July 9th of 1982. He was incarcerated at the Walpole State Prison and was released in 1997. So at the time of Molly's disappearance, he was out of prison and the detectives suspect he acted on his violent tendencies again. But the police couldn't question Francis Sr. because he was found lifeless in Massachusetts on May 4th, 2016, five years before he was even considered a suspect. But here's the thing. Detectives are now certain that he was the evil man behind Molly's disappearance and tragic passing because they had, quote, new undisclosed information on him, which led them to investigate him. As far as the evidence takes us, Francis Sumner is our guy, but police aren't able to reveal much about him just yet as the case is still under intense investigation. Revealing too much before police have definitive proof could potentially hamper this investigation. All they're saying for now is that Francis is, as far as they're concerned, the criminal. They just need a little more evidence to prove it. Investigators are trying to incorporate familial DNA testing to pinpoint whether Francis was involved in Molly's tragic end or not by working with his son's DNA. But they still haven't been able to find any fruitful results, but all this information has only recently come out, so it'll likely take a little bit longer before this case can officially be classified as closed. Twenty-four years have passed since Molly was last seen, and to this day, the case of 16-year-old Molly Bish remains open and technically unsolved, though obviously Francis Sumner is believed to be the man responsible. Unsolved cases are hard for the victims' families because they're constantly shown glimmers of hope and they expect closure, but it never comes, and they're left in this painful cycle of trying to get justice for what happened to their loved ones, grieving and hoping. Molly's family is agonized because they may never find out who drove their daughter straight into the hands of death. Whether Rodney Stranger, Gerald Battistoni, or Francis Sumner was responsible for Molly's abduction and ultimate passing, the Bish family can never see any of them facing any of the consequences because they've all already lost their lives and passed away. Where's the justice in that? It's just so chilling and scary to think that someone who abducted and led Molly to her tragic end never faced any consequences, at least not in this life. Molly's case is a horrific mystery and a real-life nightmare their family has to live with. Molly's family, from the moment she disappeared, spent all their time and energy trying to find Molly's abductor and killer, and they continued to do so 24 years after the tragedy. In 2004, not long after Molly was laid to rest, the Bish family founded the Molly Bish Foundation, which is a joint collaboration with Anna Maria College. It's an organization that spreads awareness on child safety and stresses on pushing forth laws that ensure timely and quick action for missing persons. The Bish family were left hopeless in the initial search for Molly, as police dismissed her disappearance as, quote, kids being kids or teenage rebellion. The Bish family believes that if detectives had worked seriously from the get-go, they wouldn't have wasted precious time in finding Molly, and maybe the circumstances would have been different. The Molly Bish Foundation has also provided training to first responders to ensure that missing person cases are not taken lightly, and that the action is immediate and effective. Moreover, Molly's sister, Heather, has also advocated for advanced DNA testing to quickly and efficiently narrow down suspects in cases with little to no leads. The Bish family, while still mourning the loss of their daughter, have channeled their grief in working towards bettering the actions of law enforcement, and they've made great strides in doing so. The hurt that the Bish family went through when their daughter's criminal wasn't caught, even after almost two decades passed, is something that they want to prevent other families from experiencing. And in the end, if nothing else, we can at least be grateful that Molly's name has continued to have a profound impact on her community and hopefully saved many other families from enduring the same uncertainty and heartache.
Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. I wanted to give a special thank you to a couple channel members, including Bad Kitty and Brenda Wilcoxon. If you want to become a channel member yourself, you can gain access to new videos sometimes days or weeks before they're uploaded to the public, and it's currently the best way you can support the channel and help out. I really appreciate those of you that have decided to do that. If you want to join, you can click that big join button below the video, or find the link down in the description. But as always, if you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.